All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Green Room. Uh, I'm Brandon Middleton and really, really excited to have a friend of mine um, be able to participate and have some fun in the Q&A. Uh, Markel Baldwin is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, if this is your very, very first time rocking with us, um, let me just orient you and give you a sense of what The Green Room is. Uh, we are literally looking for black and brown geniuses and creatives to come through and talk to us about you know, what they're up to, uh, some of the insights that they've been able to uh, learn throughout their careers, throughout their, you know, studies in, in, in university or in the, you know, school of the hard knocks. And then most importantly, to take some of those things and to offer it as free game for you guys who are trying to uh, put pieces together for yourself, you know, put one foot in front of the other one day at a time. So hopefully this conversation will be uh, a little funny, it'll be insightful, you'll be edutained, and, uh, you know, you'll leave having a, a new cousin, uh, cousin Markel, and uh, being able to, you know, learn about, you know, what he's into and some of his career path and things like that. So um, that's where you are, and hope, hopefully you'll be able to rock with us for the whole, for the whole hour here. But um, yeah, you're in the right place. Hope you got a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and, and a notebook out, getting ready to blast off. So with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to uh, to Markel to do an intro, you know, tell the people, you know, who, who you are, you know, where you are, what you're up to these days, and then we'll jump into some uh, some fun Q&A after that. All right. Dope. I appreciate the uh, the uh, intro. And man, you you got me hyped. I'm excited to be here. What's up, everybody? Um, my name is Markel. Um, my background is as a electrical engineer. Um, I had the pleasure and honor of working at Tesla uh, for about six years. And originally I'm from the South side of Chicago. Um, and let me be honest, did not expect to end up in Silicon Valley, didn't even know what it was um, while I was in college. So study electrical engineering, like I said, at Purdue University. And currently where I'm at today is I am in Oakland. That's where I'm currently based, but I'm in transition to Columbus, Ohio, which is very different than Oakland. Um, and very far from um, Oakland in the Bay, but I'm super excited for this next chapter um, in a new role that I'll be starting. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. Perfect, perfect. Well, um, yes, Oakland and Columbus are not similar, like at all. Give me, uh, and the people, maybe if you're watching from not Oakland, uh, what are some things you've appreciated maybe about the Bay life for the time that you've been around? Man, so there, there's a lot of different flavors that I can go into here. I would say since I lived in the South Bay, I lived in Santa Clara for like five years out of seven being here. I really enjoy, you know, the little towns of like Mountain View, Palo Alto, Redwood City, and just kicking it there. Since a lot of my work was like in Palo Alto, right? That's where my desk was. Um, and what I always enjoyed was just being able to talk about tech pretty much with anybody at any time. And I think that some people don't like that, but like for me, you know, I was kind of like, I always wanted to learn. I always wanted to see what people were, were into. Um, and then I had the chance to move to Oakland um, last year. And obviously in the midst of the pandemic was not the best time, but, you know, things started opening back up and we, start, we, we started, uh, me and my fiance started, you know, getting back out there and hanging out. And I really just love the sense of community and just uh, the types of events, the types of people and just how unique every story is and just hanging out with people in a completely different way than I was, you know, in the peninsula or South Bay. Um, but it's still really engaging, really fulfilling, really cool. Um, so, so yeah, I would say like being able to like kick it for Juneteenth or go to like a, a small comedy show um, or like a private screening of a movie um, or short film. Um, we've got to do like all those kind of things out here in Oakland and really enjoyed every single one of, um, one of those events. Yeah, so to, to like maybe juxtapose Oakland to, you know, you mentioned you're from the south side of Chicago, and we probably have some viewers from there, but like for folks that have never been to the south side, give us a little bit of a sense of, you know, young Markel growing up in the south side, uh, what that neighborhood was like, or what that experience was like, and how it like started to shape you. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question, man. And so being originally from Chicago, like, my lived experience for the first like seven, eight years was so limited, um, you know, so I lived in the projects like in the wild hundreds, like 130th King Drive um, is where I'm, I'm originally, originally from. And 
what was really interesting was I was surrounded by just, I would say, I don't want to say everybody was outgoing, but I'll just say there was a lot of stuff going on around me. And that kind of made me very reserved, right? Um, of course, there's, there's you know, violence and, and, and things like that. I think we all kind of are aware of that. But how did that manifest as a kid was, was a little bit different, right? There was, um, you know, there was little fist fights here and there and, and a lot of like, I would say, yeah, little brawls and, and just like tension around. And that was really frustrating um, to deal with, especially as, again, like a very introverted person. So it really made me more reserved and maybe more analytical to my surroundings as to like what's happening, where are the dynamics and, and understanding like maybe, you know, and kind of questioning, is there more than this? Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, and, and I'll also say like, it wasn't all bad, right? One, one thing that I love um, that I like sharing with people is like, we used to flip on mattresses. So like when I was like five or six years old, I knew how to do any type of flip. Yeah. You know what I mean? I could do a front flip, back flip, you know, off of a, a picnic table, off of a, a mattress, like any of it. And, and I would say there, there was so much fun that the kids were able to have um, that was just like truly unparalleled. And, and it was like, there were no ball sports. Like I, I didn't play basketball or like anything like that up until that point. It was just like doing flips and like that really made the day, you know? And so it, it was, as a kid, it was a cool experience, obviously like, you know, there was times where, you know, it was not as fun as, as other times. And, and then the other thing was like uh, the sense of means, right? I, I didn't know, you know, where I was as far as like socioeconomically, right? I didn't know we were at the bottom. It didn't feel like that um, because as a kid, you know, you're just trying to have fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, and realizing that there's, it was really just like a discovery of more later, but not like a sense of lacking now. Um, but I think that kind of just, gave me appreciation for just like my family relationships and just like simple things uh, like being present. So that was originally in Chicago. And then we ended up um, actually got evicted. Um, so we got evicted from the project in Chicago and I ended up moving to um, Southern Illinois mm -hmm. um, with my older brother and a trailer park. So it was like, you know, I went from the projects to a trailer park, which was like bad to bad, you know what I mean? Like as far as like a, socioeconomic class or, or, or what have you and or just quality of living. Um, but again, I didn't know any difference. I didn't know any better. And I was just grateful. Uh, I was just grateful to just have family, you know, living with my brother and my sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it was at that point, my brother kind of set the expectation for the importance of education and, and really set that precedence of like, hey, maybe in Chicago, you didn't do great, but you're gonna come here and you're gonna do well with your academics. And so it was like, you're gonna be an AB student. And up until that point in Chicago, I, I was not at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really crazy to kind of think like, he literally just said like, you will do good in school. And that changed everything. You know, that kind of shifted how I started performing. Um, so that was kind of like my very formative years in Chicago and then transitioning out to Southern Illinois. Wow. Um, that's crazy to, to think about kind of the early stages and the questions I've got are like, um, what, so you talked about the expectation being set and like mm -hmm. a bar of excellence being expected. Was it any more than that, that like needed to be kind of communicated in order to um, kind of get you to care more about the education or care more about the schooling or did you, um, you know, leading up into like how you became an engineer, like did you have an affinity for kind of sciences and math even before Big Brother was like, man, you're gonna do better than what you've been doing? Yeah, I think I think what it was, was I think my brother did a great job as far as his impact, influence and, and raising me. And one thing that he was really keen on is finding what got me excited. He mm -hmm. tried to figure it out. So he made me just try different things. I did basketball camps, I did base, you know, Little League Baseball, you know, as far as sports are concerned. Um, he made me kind of just dive into all of these different areas and would get, just gauge my enthusiasm. Yeah. And it, he discovered, you know, we kind of mutually discovered my enthusiasm one day when um, I saw some, you know, multiplication flashcards, mm -hmm. and I like just ran through them. And I was like, yo, this is fun. Yeah. And he's like, you know, that's not a game. Uh, you know what? That's a game. Yeah. Yeah. That's a game. And kind of just let me you know, think it was a game. And, you know, I learned that, you know, learned all of the flashcards. He taught me division, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few days later or something. And he saw that there was like an interest in numbers. 
-hmm. So he started just teaching me about, you know, um, fractions, percentages, things like that. And I remember, you know, computing taxes in my head or computing how much change he would get um, if he gave like, you know, 15 bucks and it was like 11, 40, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. And, and that, and that, and that was really fun for me. And so he kind of saw that interest in numbers and, and tried to just encourage it on an ongoing basis. And then kind of a little bit later, he discovered my interest in, I would say, breaking electronics, not even, I don't even want to say tinkering, but it was just pure, just yeah. breaking stuff, you know? Uh, I broke his CD. He had a nice like hundred disc CD changer, you know, you used to put in your car. Um, man, it was nice. I broke it. Um, I tried to take it apart. I could not put it back together and it got jammed. And so I felt, felt kind of bad for that. But um, there was, there was still another, there was one main story that I love sharing that it was when I, I didn't break something. I actually fixed it. I brought, uh, I bought a broken PlayStation from a classmate in uh, fifth or sixth grade, I think it was sixth grade, and, you know, paid 10 bucks for the PlayStation. And I remember just laying on the floor, sitting there trying to like tinker with it because it would turn on, but it just wouldn't read the disc. Yeah. And so I ended up just staring at it long enough and just resetting it enough times. And I realized like, hey, this little, um, I didn't know if it was a camera or what it was. I was like, but this little black dot here mm -hmm. has to like read the disc somehow. Yeah. And some, for some reason, it's not doing it right. And, you know, lo and behold, I found out that it was a connector that was essentially jostled out. So all I had to do was just reconnect the connector mm. and I had a functioning PlayStation. And, you know, it, it was, a, it seems like a small feat, but as a, you know, a fifth, sixth grader, like that was a huge moment for me. I was like, yo, I can do this. Yeah. And so that really like uh, enhanced my interest, um, you know, at a, at a, at a very young age for both, you know, the math and the tech side of things. Um, and then, you know, that kind of met at a head when I was in high school, you know, mm -hmm. when I did great in my physics class, and my physics teacher basically said, you need to study engineering. I'm like, I'm not sure what that is, but yeah. I'm good. I don't need to do that. He said, no, no, no. You need to go to college and study engineering. You're going to be great at it. And I was like, I mean, I like physics and everything, but I'm not, I'm not into trains. She's like, yeah. no, no, no. That's the other kind of engineering, <laughs> you know? And I was like, yeah. oh. And so understand, like once I understood what it was and that there was an opportunity doing that, that's when I, I took it seriously. But I wasn't honestly until like junior year of high school. Wow, that, I mean, it brings so many points that I wanna communicate out to anybody who'd be listening to this. Like um, sometimes you don't know just because you haven't seen it yet or you've never had anybody like show you or explain the full kind of definition of what an engineer could be. And kind of that early exposure is another point that I wanted to draw out. Like I remember when, um, you know, my mom, she was an accountant and she used to like have the Wall Street Journal delivered to our house every day. And she would, to your point about like being good with numbers and wanting to play games, like me and my little sisters would pick a stock and we would track that stock. So I would like look at Nike and see like, oh, it's up this many or down this many. And like, you know, look at um, the amount of returns that it's gonna give out to its shareholders every quarter. So it was really kind of that early, exposure and those exercises that were made gamified, you know, by our parents or by our community that really like kindles that, um, I don't know, that spark that turned into like, oh, now we're in these careers that uh, we totally might not have been in had not somebody in the early stages, like really um, put that shoulder around or put, put that arm around our shoulder in order to push us in that direction. So, yeah, if you're if you're listening or you're watching and maybe you didn't know what an engineer was or didn't uh, you know appreciate how many different kinds of paths you could have come from in order to get into a job like that, um, hopefully you're picking picking up what Markel is putting down. <laughs> no, well said, man. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so maybe we'll transition a little bit into um, uh, some of the questions that I, I had sent you, like the the year that we're in, 2021, right now. And even last year and the year before, like uh, society's been crazy, like uh, the technology industry and innovation and a bunch of stuff has been uh, all over the place. We saw a couple of famous people go to space uh, recently. So like, give me a sense of like the, the moment that we're in right now, um, the good, the medium and the bad of it. Like, 
how do you like synthesize it and what is what does it mean to you kind of like where you sit uh right there in oakland getting ready to move uh, across the country like what is what's the weight of it and what does it mean to you right now yeah no that's a that's a great question and and yeah there is a lot going on and as far as like the tech space i think you know a year ago we had a lot of you know um social unrest and you know i think corporations finally kind of felt like hey we need to take some more meaningful action um and so we i think we're starting to see that um take shape as far as opportunities um resources capital being given to our communities which is really exciting to see um and, and that's something that like is really encouraging you know i think that like coupled with that is is just like the lower like the ever decreasing threshold to start a business right i think it's every day is easier to start a business than the day before but like it's also like you know today is always the best day to start a business so you got those two kind of like forces working um, and so it, it's really cool to see, um, you know, like my fiance starting her own thing, you know, doing art um, or seeing, you know, friends creating content and just creating um, on their own. So it's just really cool to see tools and, and resources that are just um, so accessible and more and more accessible. So that's, that's been one really cool thing. And, and, and personally, like in my life, you know, I mentioned like my transition is going from you know Oakland to Columbus where I'll be starting a new role um, at a VC firm and so honestly man like my my year has been so blessed I think that you know there's so much turmoil and, and just like uh, sadness um, last year and for me that really helped me reorient what was important you know family relationships personal growth and just my well-being you know, yep. and it was, it was interesting because it's like, okay, and how do those things manifest? And there's a million ways those things can manifest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the type of work, your career is just one of those elements within this like more impactful piece of, you know, your life. And so kind of rooting myself in that. Um, and, and I felt like, you know, working on this, this startup venture that I had, um, and still have called Resonance, which is a community um, helping underrepresented people, you know, flourish and thrive and discover and get connected opportunities in tech has been so fulfilling for me um so being able to do that um and also seeing like the support from companies starting to come you know because i feel like i maybe i was slightly early but you know support is starting to come there um and interest um and in talent um but yeah it's been really cool to <clears throat> i would say just go from last year and, and what i would just say is like a valley of despair yeah. And feel like 2021 is, you know, you know, halfway through 2021, it seems so promising. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, and I say that I say promising intentionally because it's like we're not there yet. It's it's a journey. It's you know we're still you know in progress or you know um, on our way. Um, but I I see a lot of positive moves and a lot of really you know inspiring and kind of like overly lofty things happening at the same time right like Richard Branson going to space like that's just overly lofty like it's cool but like that doesn't really resonate with me personally um, but it's really cool to see right and, and see like all the things that are just able to happen because of technology um, so yeah I would say it's just a sense of like true um, gratitude for for how much better this year is from last year um, but also excite, excitement for like the rest of this year we're only about halfway through and I, I just see so many other great things happening, you know, on the horizon. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And you mentioned a couple of things in there, um, gratitude specifically, and then the space travel. I, I was thinking about kind of some of the inspirations and the things that kind of uh, make you hopeful about the future. And um, also, like, have they always been your inspirations or ha as you kind of gone through school and then college and then career, like have your uh, inspirations change. So talk to us a little bit about kind of what, um, what inspires you and kind of gets you up out of bed and like makes you, uh, hopeful for kind of the time we're in, in the future. Yeah, no, I think that's, I love that question. And <clears throat> honestly, you know, I would say if I answer that question, maybe, you know, two to seven years ago, right. Mm -hmm. During that period, my answer would be very different than it is now, but two to seven years ago, it was focused on how do I, my inspiration was, you know, the impact that I could individually make and like manifest, see in the world. And I thought that was like really cool um, from a sense of like a, I would say like an individual or direct contributor. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's really what motivated me. And with that, like I was also motivated, I'm, mot I'm like, intrinsically motivated by growth, right? So like, if I can get better at something, if I, if I can learn about something, get smarter, more knowledgeable, more capable, like that also is something that really motivates me and being able to leverage technology, obviously to do that is, is really exciting. Um, as of late, I would say that answer is starting to change, you know, um, having spent the last almost year, you know, about nine months working with students more closely, you know, people in college or, or early in their career and really trying to help them understand the pathways to, you know, a dope role that I was able to get like at Tesla or any other like tech company um, or engineering role, working with them is really what gets me super excited and super hyped now. I, I get messages. I just got a message earlier this week from um, actually a student that went to the same high school as me and is currently a student at the same college that I went to. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh yeah, we def, you know, we connect on you know a couple different fronts. He just got an internship at Tesla for this fall. And he just texted me and told me that news. And that was like the highlight. That is definitely the highlight of my day, you know, to hear, you know, I'm not the only, you know, black engineer at Tesla from, you know, Northwest Indiana, like he's about to be the, you know, like, and, and I think there's going to be more and just starting to see that um, it is really, really exciting. And, and seeing that, whether I contributed to it um, or influenced it or not, is just like really exciting to see. And so that's something that really motivates and inspires me is seeing that, that just the access to awesome opportunities is, is just growing and, and, you know, students are like, just being persistent and, and, and pushing themselves and growing um, as well. So that's probably what I would say excites me the most nowadays. Yeah, we're, I mean, our hearts are like aligned because there's nothing more satisfying to me than to have somebody whose resume I might have reviewed or uh, somebody I took a 30, 60 minute phone call with to help them prepare for an interview. Um, and it shifted too, because when I first got out of college and got a, a role, I'm like, oh man, just how can I move up the ladder for myself and make as much money as possible? Like, honestly, um, you know, nobody in my family had done this before and I was just excited to have bread in my pocket basically. But, yeah. um, you know, you start to figure out that these jobs are doable. Um, yep. The people that you maybe held on a pedestal for such a long time uh, and drive these fancy cars and everything, they're not, they're not better than me. They're not smarter than me. They're just um, in a different position and they've had kind of this generational help or this knowledge that has made it um, kind of more likely for them to be put in these positions. And I kind of took it as a, a job for myself to try to, you know, evangelize, just tell everybody that uh, comes from a background like me and you come from, it's like, um, if you're interested, you know, cause not, mm -hmm. Engineering is not for everyone. Sales is not for everyone. Business development is not for everyone. But I, we don't want people counting themselves out on the notion that, you know, you don't belong because you're intellectually not capable of doing this, like these jobs. Like literally anybody from our community can do anything that I've seen in my 17 years doing this. And yeah. um, if, if nobody gets anything else outside of this talk than just that, um, take that as a bar, put it in your back pocket and don't discount yourself because um, there's not much that a person who's determined, a person who's got like the school of the hard knocks education in addition to the formal education, um, like you talked about space, like literally the sky is the limit for, for folks yeah. like that, so. Yeah, I, I wanted to add on to that. I, I <clears throat> when I work with students, like one thing that I really try to communicate, mostly implicitly, is this idea of how do I navigate through through a, a few levels, right? The first level is exposure, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's how do I get the word out that something exists, yep. right? They may not even know about it. Once I can do that, then I can express this sense of possibility, right? Where possibility to me is someone has done this, right? I know an engineer, you may see an engineer, this is an engineer, right? And then the next thing is attainability, where attainability to me is like being able to say, I can do this, right? Possibility is like, someone's done it, right? Someone could do it. 
but then attainability is being able to say that I can do it. Yep. And what I just want to like reiterate from what you're saying is like, don't impose those barriers on yourself. Like you can do it. Like I, I am no different from, from you, you know, you, you know, literally you and, you know, the listeners, the viewers in the sense of like, I just had a curiosity. I applied myself. I got lucky. And, you know, there's a, obviously variables I couldn't control, but my mindset was always that this is attainable. And I always try to push to the attainability of things. Um, and, and, and I think that's what helped me kind of trudge through like the, the, the darker times where, you know, when I was in college, I was like, man, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this, but I'm like, let me just keep studying. But yeah. I, I truly believe like to your point, if, if this is something that you want to do, like it is attainable. And I mean, we're, we're living examples of it. Um, but it's like, I don't think we're that far away from, from anyone who is a couple steps behind. Yeah. Let's talk about like some of those, um, those challenging times, because like my aim for these talks is like always to like say, Hey, this is where I bump my head, or this is where, you know, I scrape my knee. And for folks that might listen to this and know they can avert that situation or at least have another data point. Um, what are some things, um, in college or in kind of the early career that you were like, um, if you were to tell young Markel from like some years back, you would have done it differently, but you've learned something from, from that particular mistake or challenge. Yeah. Um, I have a few, um, I'll start with this idea that I, I'm, I'm really like keen on right now. And, and it's this notion of like, there's no such thing as a self-made millionaire. Mm. And I, I say that in like, with the, the idea of like, people think that you have to do it alone. You have to be self-reliant or exclusively self-reliant. And what happened was I made a few, a, a lot of mistakes because of this, right? So one early mistake was my, my dream school, um, I applied for my dream school, but I couldn't pay for the application fee. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just sat there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I didn't ask anybody like, hey, I need help with this. Mm -hmm. I just sat on it. And then the application deadline passed and I was like, oh, crap, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, so I finally called the school and I'm like, hey, I don't have the money to pay for the application. They're like, it's too late. You're not going to get in. And I was like, OK, I messed that up. So mm -hmm. that was really, really frustrating. Another time I did that, you know, kind of manifested in a different way was when I was in college, I didn't you know, there was a period of time where I did not want to work with other people. Mm -hmm. I would just go in a library you know, turn my phone off, turn off everything and just like stare at a book and yep. think that I could just absorb all of this content. And it worked sometimes, but most times it didn't. And the point of school, you know, one of the points was like to learn how to collaborate, to, to learn how to learn from other people, to mm -hmm. teach other people. And, you know, I was just trying to be self-reliant. I thought I have to learn this myself. You know, this is my grade. I have to do it myself. Yep. And so I really did a lot by myself, which is pretty good to get as far as I got. But I was like, man, I can't get much further yeah. if I do this, you know. And so yeah. I started to, you know, lean on other people, and understand the idea or the sense of collaboration and, and how valuable it is. You know, that whole one plus one is three, you know, the, you know, and so that concept. And, and I think that was one really big piece. Um, another big piece that I, I think was rooted in mindset as well was the sense of um not self-advocating mm. um, i think i did a good job at that in some spaces but uh, but a lot of times i would you know instead of you know one way i'm thinking of the self-reliance as far as like asking for help yeah. and then the self-advocacy -advo as far as like asking for opportunity mm -hmm. um so i didn't do that you know i kind of was just like i'm grateful for whatever i get and whatever falls in my lap i'll take it yeah. And, and, and that really kind of like stunted some growth um, in, in my, in my career where, you know, at Tesla, I, I wasn't self-advocating in the beginning. I wasn't diving into solving problems. And, and it was, the, it was because of the whole imposter syndrome, which I think we all know well um, now, but it was just like, that was such a, a toxic, toxic piece um, and toxic mindset that I had. And I, and once I realized like I have to just self-advocate and, and basically speak up and say, these are the things that I'm capable of, even if I haven't done it yet, you know, and kind of speak it into, into reality and say, signing up for work that 
you know, I may not have 100% knowledge of, but I'm like, I got 30% so I can at least get started and yeah. I'll figure out the rest along the way. And so that, that sense of like knowing that just because I don't know it today doesn't mean I can't do it um, overall. So those were some of the, the big mistakes that I made where it, it was just, it, it, it was really paralyzing in either, you know, my mindset or paralyzing in actual progress that, that I was able to achieve up until a certain point. Yeah, that those are some gems and some bars in there. And you've taken me back to like uh, my college days, even like um, I was at the University of Illinois freshman year. I think I was number four or five out of a thousand kids at my high school. So I was like used to being the top of my class. I had a, a study schedule. And I'm like, I got this. I came in and uh, I got rocked my first semester <laughs> of college because of that attitude that I could just do it myself. I remember going to the career fair on the quad and or not career fair, but like this, um, this activities fair and this like groups fair in the Nesby, you know, National Society of Black Engineer little uh, booth was there and they're like, join us, join us. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I can like, I can do it by myself. And then after getting rocked to your point about one plus one equals three, for me to go into the Nesby office at the University of Illinois and like see a, a file drawer full of people's past exams and to see just the resource that they had created for a freshman like me to be able to see what my sophomore year test might look like or my junior year, or my senior year, and to have like all these things documented. I think like how arrogant were you, Brandon, to think that you could like do all of this all by yourself? But that first semester, you know, sub 2.0 uh, GPA, like I had to go mm -hmm. through that knee scrape in order to fully appreciate it. And that second semester, people, they thought I had dropped out because they never saw me, but I was in the Nesby office or the tutoring facility or the library. Um, no more parties, no more video games in the dorm room. And I got like a 3.75 or something that second semester. Wow. Ah, this is what it takes in order to be successful at this place. So, yeah. um, you know, it took me five years to graduate because of that first bad semester. But so many like bars in what you're saying in terms of like, I had to learn to collaborate with other people. And, you know, who wouldn't listen to somebody who's been there and done that and is actually mm -hmm. trying to help you creating resources and all of that. So for anybody listening, I would say that, um, you know, the answer to your question has probably already been answered and more than like doing it yourself for the first time, um, trying to find and network your way into the people or the community that know how to help you the best way is probably um, something you can do to take yourself further, faster, whether we're talking about you in college right now, um, you in the school of hard knocks on your block right now, or, you know, you in your career. So, um, man, thank you for sharing that, because that's definitely a topic that I also struggled a lot with early on. Yeah, man. So maybe um, we've got, I think, about 15 or 20 left. Let us do a little bit of a fun lightning round. Um, okay. I'm just going to ask some questions about to try to dig into who, who who is Markel, give people who are listening a little bit more uh, detail and context. So um, you mentioned back flipping on the mattress, like back in the younger days and like didn't get into ball sports back then. Um, what are just some hobbies and things that you do kind of outside of your work right now that you've uh, developed a passion for? Yeah, I would say, you know, as far as like um, exercise, you know, being active, something light is, I love hooping. You know, I'm not, I'm not a baller, you know, there's a whole, there's levels. So I always try to like, make sure I, I don't overhype myself. Like I like, yeah. I like to play, but I'm not saying I'm anything. I just, I just like to play. Yeah. Um, but as far as like an indoor activity that I've, I've really become fond of um, over the years and it really actually started in high school um, was making music, making beats. Cool. So I, I truly enjoy that. Like I have a keyboard, like right under my desk here. Um, I've been making beats since I was like 15, you know? So I had a friend who kind of put me on a Fruity Loops FL studio. Yes, sir. And we used to you know, <laughs> play around with that. We upgraded to Reason. We started making beats on that. And, um, you know, now I have a little bit better of a setup. Um, so 
I dabble with, uh, you know, maybe playing my trumpet sometimes mm -hmm. or playing a keyboard. I had an electronic drum set at one point. Um, but yeah, I just love all things music, you know, so um, so I play it. I also recently started um, collecting vinyl records. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a turntable and really enjoying that. And so I think I'm going to get into um, improving my hardware. So and as an electrical engineer, like I'm very meticulous. So I'm like, maybe I should just design it myself. But, <laughs> you know, some of the components are, you know, the components aren't expensive. What's really expensive is just like, you know, meeting certain, you know, specification requirements. You know what I mean? Like, how do I ensure that there's a level of like, like one metric is total harmonic distortion. And like, you want to have that low. But mm -hmm. some people argue you kind of want to have it high because it creates a little bit of like, you know, high frequency resonance. And you're like, oh, I don't know. And so it's like really hard to like think through that. but. I think that just having that hardware, having that, you know, quality speakers, um, quality amp, you know, yeah. coupled with the analog, just a full analog experience. Um, it really does make it really fun to listen to music. Um, so, you know, as far as, you know, I love making it, but I also love listening to it um, in a really cool setting. That's super dope. I, I've been knowing you for a little while and like never knew that you had this yeah. kind of musical kind of beat making side too. So, um, Man, I remember the last beat I made was probably Reason 3. So like way, way back. I had Reason 3, yep. <laughs> yeah. Got a um, the inbox in the garage and Pro Tools and all that. So it's like um, something about being an engineer and music maybe that we've got mm -hmm. those sides of the brain that come together uh, in yeah. the music production. But that's super cool to, to know. Um, maybe I'll transition over to like, like books or shows or podcasts and things that you uh, yeah. like tap into in order to like keep yourself educated or edutained or yeah you know, no I love that question I actually just got the app Goodreads, Goodreads. Um, so if you haven't if you haven't checked that app out it's great you can actually track all of your your current books your previous books you can review them you can write little notes for yourself um, so I'm, I'm starting to use that so I'm just pulling that up to like just list out some of my yeah. my favorite reads I you know, it's interesting because like, if you would have asked me that question, you know, like five years ago or when I was in college, I was not a fan of reading, but now I understand the value of it. Yeah. And I truly enjoy, you know, a lot of the pieces that I get into. Um, so I love reading different things from, you know, philosophy, psychology, um, black history. Um, so the, the following list will be representative of the, you know, kind of, you know, different areas of interest. Um, one book, that I, I really, really value. Probably my favorite book of 2020 was Nudge by Daniel Kahneman. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, he's, he's a, I think he's an economist or psychologist, but he won a Nobel prize. And, and you know, he, he explains these like two systems of the mind and how we make decisions and kind of like, you know, the human fallacy. And so really comprehensive um, book, really dense. Um, but I really enjoyed that. And that's probably like my favorite book last year because, you know, it really helped, it really helped me challenge certain actions, certain decisions, decisions that I would make, you know, the fundamental premise was like, you have two systems of the mind. You have like the automatic system that if you say two plus two, you already know it's four. Um, and then you have the, and that takes no effort at all. Then you have like the, you know, more intensive side of the brain that is, um, requires you know more resources um and so if i say 17 times 34 you're going to be like mm, whatever yeah. um but you could figure it out but you just don't want to um and so that's kind of like how system one works it's like i'd rather just do things that are easy so it's really how do you combat that and in in life or you know in society there's a lot of um points of decision or points of analysis and we typically lean on our system one and we rarely have our system two to like uh validate or verify. Um, so that was a really fun book. And, and I would say that would be coupled with um, Richard Thaler's Nudge. Uh, yeah, Richard Thaler's Nudge, which is about choice architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so he has this like kind of, um, I would say approach or kind of argue like framework of, uh, or I would say philosophy um, of like um, libertarian paternalism, which says freedom of choice, but I'll make the first choice for you. So like, if you have like a, a set of options, if you have a, a, a salad bar, it's like, I'll put all of the things in order and then I'll put the dessert at the end because I am the choice architect and I wanna make sure you make a good choice, but yeah. I'm not preventing you from making bad choices. Yeah. 
And so understanding how different systems are designed um, is really interesting to me and how it influences the choices that we make if it's an opt-in or opt-out um, situation um, and how hard it is it to like navigate between opt-in and opt-out. I think th those are just really fascinating books um, on that front. Um, some other books that I've enjoyed was another one that I liked last year was Quiet by Susan Cain, which is really just the power of introverts. And, yep. and for me, I'm a very introverted person. So while I'm very talkative right now, once yep. we're done with this, I am going to curl up in a ball <laughs> and probably not talk for the rest of the day. Um, and it really talks about the, the power of being introverted. Um, and, and I didn't, I never thought that there was power in that, um, but it was really a reassuring thing to, you know, be more authentic in who I actually am as an introvert. Um, let me see if I have any other good recommendations. Um, let's see. Oh, I have a, where's it at? It's um, Michelle Alexander's, um, the, the name is escaping me. New Jim Crow? Yeah, the new Jim Crow. Yeah, Michelle Alexander's um, new Jim Crow. I mean, it's a fantastic and frustrating read, but I, I would say like th that was, it is such a well-written, um, really like historical archive um, that that I would say has really given me a lot of perspective. Um, you know, giving me perspective of things that I didn't realize was happening to me as far as like being profiled, maybe being pulled over. Um, you know, I remember reading that part of the book and was just like, oh man, I get pulled over all the time. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> they ask me questions and I'm like, oh, I didn't know this was uh, not yeah. normal. I just assumed that's um, standard operation. So really getting that, uh, that a perspective and understanding um, was really enlightening. And again, you know, nonetheless, like frustrating the policies, the, the practices that are in place, but um, really um, valuable read, very, very educational. So. That, that's just one of the books. And oh, also, I just started reading um, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun by um, Reginald F. Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that one's really cool. And it's, it's a, I think it's an autobiography, but it seems like a biography at the same time. But um, really, you know, talking about his life. And I think he, he businessman that ended up um, overseeing like a billion dollar um, either merger or acquisition. I can't remember which one it was. Um, I guess, you know, it depends on which side you're in. But um, so, yeah, seeing him and, and reading about his life, his journey in Baltimore um, was is, has been really cool. Um, just seeing like black excellence, you know, um, just in another light, another story. Yeah, that's awesome. And those are some good ones. Um, I've read and heard about a couple of them. And then like Nudge, I'd never I never heard of that one. So I'll put that one on my little list of things to do yeah. here in the near future. Um, let's like close out the little lightning round with maybe some food and travel. So, you know, COVID is, is lifting a bit and people are starting to get on airplanes and stuff. Um, so I asked you like this combo question about, you know, your favorite foods, but then also like favorite travel destinations that maybe you've been before already you want to go back to, or like places that are on your bucket list to go that you've, you've seen images of, but you've never been there before. Yeah, I would I would say I'll start with the food. So me and my fiance, we love Thai food. We love Ethiopian food. Um, those are probably our favorite, our top two cuisines, and followed by Indian food. So that probably be our, our top three. You know, any day of the week, if we're ordering food or going somewhere, it's probably one of those three categories. Um, so I, I would say you know that that's anything in that in that space is 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 a good pick for us. Um, and then as far as um, places to travel. I would I would say, you know, all of those places are worth, you know, all those um, cuisines are worthwhile locations or, you know, destination points as well, right? I think we would love to, to visit each one of those um, um, places or countries. Um, and then on top of that, I I have big aspirations to go to London. I, I know, I, you know, I don't think it's like a necessarily like visually scenic, but what I really want to do is I want to go deep into London, like understand like the music scene there, mm -hmm. you know, cause I listened to some, some um, London artists um, and London music overall. And I just want to see, like, I want to go to like a shop and like listen to live music when I'm in London, like see somebody up and coming. And, and I always love like that idea of like seeing artists before they blow up. So like I've gotten to see different artists before they, they got as big as they are now. And that's always like super fun for me. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that like London would be a cool place to be able to like experience music. It, it's, it's, it's a different vibe and different um, dynamic, I imagine. Like, again, coming from just the States is going to be different, but like coming from Chicago or coming from Oakland, that's, that's also going to be like a completely different experience. And I'm really intrigued to see what that's like. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And like the, even like what black and brown is when placed kind of in another context would is so fascinating for me to think about. So if I were to just randomly come across the path of another black or brown person with a, like a British accent, <laughs> I'd be so like yeah. intrigued and like we'd probably talk for a long time and like be able to trade stories about um, being kind of outside of the mainstream, but like in a totally different way because I don't have that experience and that person wouldn't have mm -hmm. my experience. So um, yeah, definitely a, a thing that to our previous point, books has put me on to like this whole other um, swath of people that share some of what I have, some of what you have, but then also like have a very different uh, take on things too, just based on culture, based on geography, based on a bunch of different stuff. So um, it's been fun to put this community college wave together to, um, again, like, you know, get people's recommendations and understand kind of their context, but then also um, to share our own experiences and hopefully the folks that will listen and watch this kind of thing will again be encouraged to do similar things I think more of what we need as a society is to just have more conversations and connection points with each other and then kind of the wall of extreme left versus extreme right will start to like disintegrate as we have more uh, points of commonality and understanding between us so that's I'm, I'm excited for the future. Um, I'm gonna be texting you uh, as I as I make my way through Nudge and some of the other places and things yeah. that you said. But um, yeah, at this point, I want to ask: like, is there anything like our community of community college folks who uh, who have kind of gone on this journey can help you with, like, as you make your transitions or um, any things that we can provide a boost for you on? Yeah, I would say you know one thing and. and I'll say I'm not really good at pubbing myself or like asking for, you know, that again, I mentioned that's a, that was a challenge or, or a challenging point or area. But one thing that I would love just support and engagement on would be, you know, my YouTube channel, something that I've been trying to do for a while. Um, I'm not as consistent as I want to be, but I'm trying to always provide quality content. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my content focuses on um, mindset, careers, um, and tech, yep. right? So, really I think it like tries to embody who I who I am for the most part and really trying to show and showcase you know avenues and just like the the personal side of how you can develop to be a great engineer and be be somebody you know in the tech space so you know support on that channel um and in any way shape or form um is definitely appreciated um I think that that's probably the number one thing that I can think of right now perfect perfect well, um, yeah, we've got just a couple minutes left and I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed kind of uh, reminiscing a little bit and learning uh, some new things about you. And then again, just being able to, uh, to reflect and to share things that I think the community could benefit from. Um, maybe the last couple of questions I would ask is just, um, you know, pretend our community is full of uh, younger versions of yourself. Uh, drop a couple of if you, if you don't take anything else from this talk, but this, this, and this, what would you tell kind of your younger self or the community um, to put in their back pockets as they kind of roll out from this conversation? Mm, that's a great question. I would say, you know, I'm channeling that, that <laughs> talking to that person. Okay, I know where you are. Okay, number one, bias towards action, right? The, the whole Jeff Bezos quote, I think. Um, if you think you should do it, try it. Um, you know, it, it, I don't like to operate in a sense of regret. So don't either, you know, operate and, and use that to learn. I think that we assume that we're gonna learn something um, hands off, but you really just gotta get your hands on it, understand it. And that's when you're gonna be able to make the judgment call of this is what I like, or this is what I don't like. So I would just say, lean into that. and there's no wasted time, there's no wasted effort. Um, so that'd be the first thing. The second thing I would say is 
determine your intrinsic motivators. Um, for me, it's always been about how do I grow more? Um, how do I become a better version of myself? And so using that as an in intrinsic motivator helps me um, then find ways in which I could achieve that, whether it's reading books, whether it's taking a you know, challenging assignment or project at work. Um, to, but it's really important for us to figure out what our intrinsic motivators are, because if we don't figure out our intrinsic motivators, somebody will figure out an in extrinsic motivator and get us to do that. Yeah. And so that whether it's chasing status, whether it's chasing money or something like that, you, you, you'll, you'll end up doing something that you actually don't want to do because you think you should want to do it. Um, yeah. So you got to figure out what that intrinsic motivator is for you before someone else tries to impose what it should be. Um, and, and the last thing, you know, I said it before, but I think it's worth um, repeating was just the sense of collaboration. You know, it, it, collaboration is not just at a peer level it's it's also like at a mentor at a mentee level so like working with people at different stages um, different positions um, that's where we're going to be able to make the biggest difference in our community whether you know you're you're young or experienced um, a novice being able to just collaborate um, authentically and and really selflessly um, is really what's going to be super transformative in really all of our journeys and all of our growth. Um, so I, I would say those those are just some of the big things that I would want to tell my younger self um, to focus on. Thank you, man. That's like a, a, a mic drop of a moment right there, brother. And I guess for, for, for my takeaways, like, it's funny to like listen to, you know, somebody that was evicted at one point from there you know, place of residence to myself, somebody that had a speech impediment till they were like nine years old and couldn't like articulate himself. Uh, throw it back to you, somebody that um, has gone from humble beginnings all the way through tech into like the land of a VC now. Um, to my side, you know, literally everything that I walk into now is bigger than anything I could have even written down and dreamed for myself. So hopefully like this conversation for, any of the shorties or the younger generation that's on um, to that point that we made earlier to not discount yourself. Like you, you've heard a couple of challenges that each of us have gone through. Um, you've heard about how somebody who almost flunked out of school <laughs> first semester in, in college uh, persevered. Um, you, you learn how somebody who bought a PlayStation for $10, you know, fixed that, made it work and sparked uh, his interest all the way through uh, college and into a career in engineering. So um, I just want to say thank you, Markel, for being transparent and being open with, with me and with the audience here. And it's just this kind of thing that I think um, the young people need to hear. And even our peers and colleagues who haven't cracked, you know, how they can take all that good intention uh, that they have now, that they've seen some crazy things over the last year. Um, we're setting the example and you're a great role model for people to uh, pattern their own lives and their own selves after. So I want to give you flowers and say, you know, I appreciate you and uh, everything you stand for and kind of the direction that you're going. So um, yeah, if, I think we, we're at the end of our time, but man, I've had a great time and appreciate you again, investing time with our community. And um, man, like you said, the, the best parts of your day are helping students like some of also, the best parts of my week are being able to connect with, you know, like-minded folks to do stuff like this. So I hope you had a good time too, man. Yeah, man. I just, I just, if I may, I just want to express gratitude to you, right? Um, putting this on, building this community, building this space for us um, is, is so powerful and so valuable. And so I just want to give you kudos for, you know, gathering people to extract insights and, and relay insights because I think that it's so important to pass on knowledge, right? This is the equivalent to, to what you described before. This is the, these are the previous exams, right? With the answer key, right? This, this conversation is the answer key to a different exam. So your life won't be the same exam, but like you'll be able to take the lessons from this exam, my life, you know, my journey, and then apply it hopefully in yours. And so you're doing that and you're giving all of these you know, exams out and that's gonna be so empowering and that's gonna be so motivating. Um, 
because to your point, right? I think a lot of us, you know, I struggled too in the beginning of college. Like um, a lot of us, you know, have that like rough beginning where it's like, I don't even know if I can do this. Mm -hmm. And just, again, this space helps bring this sense of attainability um, in, in, in action um, to, to whatever path we're trying to pursue or currently on, right? And so I think that this is incredible um, and I love the space that you're doing, like you're providing and I'm excited to see where it goes from here, excited to collaborate in other ways in the future, but Brandon, I truly appreciate you, man. And thank you for having me today. Sure thing, sure thing. I appreciate that, man. Um, well, community, uh, give the flowers virtually to uh, Cousin Markel. He started as strangers, but now we're family. <laughs> uh, have a great rest of the week, man. Uh, blessings to you and your family. And uh, before long, we'll connect and do something like this uh, real, real soon. Yes, for sure. All right. Peace out, everybody. Take care, man.